So first I'd like to thank Professor Gracia Raga for inviting me here and um, in her absence I've been very well taken care of by Luis and Diego and of course Professor Dave Adams who uh, has been, been um, very very nice to me and, and to Richard too. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start off showing this animation of brightness temperature measured from satellites. It's basically infrared radiation as measured at the top of the atmosphere. And when you first look at this animation, uh, and this came up yesterday uh, when we were talking about organization of mesoscale convection uh, in the mid-latitudes versus the tropics, it may seem chaotic at first, when, when you're, 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 you're looking at this, a lot of mesoscale convective system organization. Uh, these smaller cells here, and you see many of these are, are moving westward over time, and uh, a lot of them are, are also moving eastward over time. But I'm going to argue that actually uh, there is an organization to these disturbances on the very largest scale. And maybe uh, you can notice, those of you who've been staring at this for a while can notice that actually the envelope of convection starts out here in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Of course, uh, it spins off two tropical depressions that propagate into each hemisphere. But over time, this envelope is moving in this direction towards the east. And uh, you'll see that uh, this is actually a result of a large scale disturbance in the atmosphere. And I'm going to be talking about various types of disturbances that organize convection on the largest scales as opposed to the mesoscale, which is what Rich was talking about yesterday. So if we go to the first slide, and uh, by the way, I uh, welcome questions at any time. If anything's not clear, please just feel free to, to interrupt. That's no problem. Um, much of the latter part of this talk was done with my colleagues Juliana Diaz and Kazu Kikuchi. And I'm going to be talking about uh, observations of convective organization by the Madden-Julian oscillation, the MJO as it's called, uh, and, but also the other waves that make up this MJO. So, um, you notice in that anim animation at some level it looked fairly chaotic and yesterday it was even brought up that a lot of the convection in the tropics is stochastic, uh, tends to be chaotic. But I'm going to argue that, at least to my eye, this convection is actually f fairly well organized in, in, in many cases. And an easy way to look at this is to make a time-longitude diagram by averaging that brightness temperature that you saw in the animation. Uh, in this case, from 5 south to 5 north. So this is an equatorial strip of brightness temperature for these three months here in 2002. We're going from the Greenwich meridian to the Greenwich meridian. So this is a global view along the equator. Now, what do you see? Um, in the animation, I mentioned things were moving both eastward and, and westward especially on the mesoscale. So it's, it's a tricky thing to pick out these disturbances if you're especially just looking at an animation. But in this form, what you do see is that there appear to be these linear features here moving eastward. So time's going down. These are moving eastward over time. And embedded within those envelopes are smaller scale, higher frequency disturbances that are moving both eastward and westward. So it's much easier to see in, in this Hofmuller diagram form uh, what, what's going on on the, on the very largest scales. 
Now, um, the title of the talk contains this term MJO, Madden-Julian Oscillation, and this is really the most important large-scale disturbance by far in, in the tropics. And uh, this was discovered in 1971 by Madden and Julian, actually in, in Boulder, uh, Colorado at NCAR. And you can see quite clearly here, there's an envelope of convection moving eastward at about five meters per second. That's very typical of the MJO. But within it, there are all these smaller scale features going in both westward and eastward directions at different phase speeds and different scales. And then the other thing you've probably noticed is that there are these somewhat faster moving eastward envelopes. So I'm drawing a phase line here. This is a 13 meter per second phase speed. And uh, these are known as convectively coupled Kelvin waves. So I'll be focusing quite a lot on, on those in, in, in this talk as well as the MJO. And if you look up here, you see several examples, and there are many more, uh, the closer you look at this, at this diagram. Some of them are actually embedded in the MJO, like this one here. Uh, I will point out that these are very important disturbances. This is the um, coast of South America here. These are very important disturbances over the Amazon region. You can see several examples here, as well as these westward propagating squall lines that have been studied uh, quite a lot uh, over the Amazon. George, how, how sensitive is it to the, the scale of the averaging over which you make it? Can you go down to one degree and you can still see these? Well, things? yeah, these things extend uh, to about an equatorial Rossby radius out in, in terms, of, so uh, you, you need a few degrees, uh, unless you're um, unless you're averaging or looking right along the axis of, of the wave itself. But, but there is a, a meridional scale to these. And um, these waves, by the way, uh, it, 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 it may not be obvious just from this 2D picture, but they, they move, all of these waves are constrained to propagate along the equator. In other words, they propagate eastward and westward and they're equatorially trapped and we'll talk about that coming up here in a minute. Um, just want to show you a couple of quick examples before moving on here. This is the the last northern winter. Uh, uh, same kind of diagram, same averaging five south to five north from December through March of, of this past year. And you can see we had, a, uh, of course, a big El Nino event going on. And uh, during this event, these Kelvin waves, you can see them here, were very, very important um, in terms of the convective organization over the Pacific. Here's the date line here. So the Pacific runs from here to, to here, and this is South America. Not much Kelvin wave activity in this example over the Amazon. George? Yes. So how did you tell the difference between the MJO and the convectively coupled Kelvin wave from looking at that diagram? Well, um, actually, okay, so I, I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot to mention one thing. The, the event, even though the animation was called MJO.AVI, that event is actually this thing here. <laughs> it's not what is more of a classic looking MJO, a larger scale, slower moving um, envelope. That event in that animation was actually kind of in between a K Kelvin wave and, and the MJO. And there is a continuum there, and I don't really want to get into the details here, but it is actually difficult to cleanly distinguish between, uh, at times, large Kelvin waves and, and the MJO. So but you can do, but it's done based on this diagram alone, not other information. Well, uh, the other information would be the circulation associated with the waves, but actually that's tricky too because they tend to be uh, organized in a similar way, even from, from the mesoscale on up. We're going to talk about that coming up too. So 
Yeah, lots, lots of Kelvin waves here. You can, you can see some of them actually, uh, in fact, you can sometimes trace them clear around the globe more than once. Uh, they, they tend to be long lasting at times. These are coming from the Indian Ocean across Indonesia into the Pacific, for instance. And then just as an, uh, a contrast, this is a La Nina year, December 1998, 99, March 99. And uh, because of the cold sea surface temperatures during that event, you see very little convective activity over the Pacific in this case. Still plenty of Kelvin waves here. And in this case, plenty of Kelvin wave activity uh, over South America as well. So there's a lot of variability in, in these waves. And, and some of that has to do with the sea surface temperature and the large scale environment. George? that they're embedded in. Sorry, yes. sure, right here. <laughs> oh, hi, Yolanda. <laughs> so there's that gap in the convective signature. Do you see, um, do they propagate as dry waves across the cold? At, yes. So that's the source of the ones in South America? Uh, sometimes. Uh, about half of the Kelvin waves over the Amazon come in from the Pacific, and uh, on roughly 30% are actually caused by disturbances that come in from the extra tropics. The other 20% might be just forced in situ by mesoscale convection that happens to project on the large scale. So you were kind of pointing at the, the Indian Ocean. Uh, is, is that sort of the genesis region for? Not for necessarily. As you can see here, plenty of these waves originate just east of the Andes okay. here. So, uh, and, and as I was just saying, uh, uh, right. some of them are actually forced by pressure surges from the high latitudes. We, we wrote a paper on that about 10 years ago. Uh, we can talk about that later. Okay, so I've been uh, tossing these terms around Kelvin wave um, and um, MJO. And what I want to address now is whether there's a theoretical framework uh, that, that can help us understand how this convection is organized on the large scale. And it turns out there is. Uh, there's a classic paper by Taro Matsuno that came out in 1966. This is a wonderful example of a theoretical development that actually preceded the observational counterpart. So Matsuno predicted that these modes uh, should exist, trapped modes along the equator, using this relatively simple system. And uh, it turned out almost immediately afterwards, these waves were identified in the atmosphere. And probably uh, a lot of you also know that these waves are very important in the equatorial ocean as well. So, um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, on this part of the talk, but uh, just to give you a feel for that there's a theoretical framework that we can at least talk about uh, most of, of these waves uh, and understand why they move along the equator and why they actually impact convection in the tropics. So. Matsuno used uh, what's called the equatorial shallow water system. Uh, and this theory governs the behavior of shallow fluid on the equator. There are two, two restoring forces, gravity. So gravity waves, just like a, a wave in the ocean uh, or on a lake, uh, is, is one of the restoring forces. And then rotation. So that's, that's the important part of the equatorial trapping. It's a linear theory and um, the this theory is um, developed about a basic state at rest. So it um, part of this linearization and a key really is that Matsuno used what's called the equatorial beta plane approximation. So the meridional gradient of the Coriolis term was treated as a constant. So we all know that the Coriolis term, the Coriolis force, if you picture a rotating planet, uh, 
Coriolis force is zero at the equator. But it actually changes sign at the equator, and in fact, the meridional gradient is maximum on the equator. This beta, as it's called, the meridional gradient of the Coriolis term, is maximized on the equator, and it actually doesn't change that much if you picture a sphere near the equator. It changes much more rapidly when you go poleward. So Matsuno took that meridional gradient at the equator and treated that as a constant, and that works very well for the region of the equator. So the other part has to do with the gravity wave speed, and the gravity wave speed in a shallow water system is, is very simply related to the depth of the, the fluid. So in water, this works actually very, very well for waves that are long compared to the depth of the fluid. So that's another approximation, which is actually a pretty good approximation in both the ocean and the atmosphere. So the speed of a gravity wave in shallow fluid is simply the square, square root of the gravitational constant times the depth of the fluid. And this works, as I mentioned, really well for these very long waves like tsunamis. So if you have a 4,000 meter depth ocean, a tsunami, if you plug it into this equation, should move at about 200 meters per second. And that is actually very, very close to what's observed. So that works very well. Then, uh, yeah, this is just this um, beta, uh, beta plane approximation here that I mentioned earlier. So uh, it, F is just set to the value of beta, the meridional gradient of F at the equator, times whatever the latitude is. So Matsuno combined those terms into a system of equations. Again, it's a linear system. So we have a zonal momentum equation so that, okay, this phi is just the depth of the fluid. So if you have a gradient in the zonal direction, in the east-west direction here of the depth of the fluid, that's going to give rise to an acceleration locally of the fluid itself. And then beta in this this zonal momentum equation acts on V, it acts on U in the meridional momentum equation, and then very importantly, this is the equation of continuity. So this actually gives you convergence and divergence in the fluid, depending on the depth of the fluid, or the um, change in the depth of the fluid locally over time. You can picture if the fluid is getting deeper, right, that leads to convergence, and if it's getting shallower, that leads to divergence. And then um, this H comes in here, the depth of the fluid, as the so-called equivalent depth. And that's, in this theory, basically a scaling factor. And it's an important point, actually. Uh, we don't have time to talk about it in detail here, but it's one of the very interesting parts of, of this theory. Uh, you can actually come up with an equivalent depth for the various waves uh, that, that based on observations. Okay, so um, the theory is linear and therefore it has normal modes. So this is just like a guitar string at a certain tension when plucked will fluctuate at a certain frequency based on the normal mode of that system. This system has a fairly rich spectrum of normal modes. And what you can get out of the theory is uh, what the different normal modes are. And then the relationship, and this is an, an important point here uh, that's going to come up again when, when we start looking at spectra of observations. We can relate the zonal wave number or the east-west scale of the wave to frequency 
for each of these normal modes. So the way it's plotted here, eastward zonal wave number, this is just the number of waves around a latitude circle. Eastward zonal wave numbers are on the right and negative zonal wave numbers or westward moving zonal wave numbers are on the left. So wave one would be one wave around the globe, wave two, two waves and so on. So here are, these are some of the modes that Matsuno identified uh, in this system. And for instance, this is the Kelvin mode. So this is basically an equatorially trapped gravity wave and it has a linear relationship you can see between wave number and frequency. In other words, it's a non-dispersive wave. This wave hangs together um, very well in both the atmosphere and ocean, which is why it can travel such long distances. The other waves are in this diagram uh, correspond to curves, which means they're dispersion, dispersive. So the energy propagates uh, away from the wave center in, in each of these other waves. So we have mixed Rossby gravity waves here, equatorial Rossby waves, westward inertial to eastward inertial gravity waves here, and, and, and so on. So this comes straight out of the theory. No observations at all involved here. Okay, the other thing you get from the theory is the horizontal structure of the waves. This is the theoretical structure of a Kelvin wave. So what I've plotted here are the winds. So Kelvin waves have only zonal, a theoretical Kelvin wave at least, only has zonal flow, east-west flow. Um, v is zero in, in this wave. And the zonal flow is maximum on the equator, you can see here, and then it decays exponentially away. Pressure is plotted in contours, and you can see that the zonal flow is in phase with pressure. So in this region here, this zonal flow, it's purely zonal, will lead to convergence. And that's shaded in blue. So if this were a low level circulation associated with a Kelvin wave, we would expect convergence in this region in between high and westerlies and low and easterlies. And then this is where you might expect convection to develop then. So we have low level convergence in this part of the wave low level divergence in red in this part of the wave. So convection would tend to be suppressed in this region, in these regions here, and enhanced in this region. Okay, um, oh, another very important point. Uh, this is a symmetric wave about the equator. So as I mentioned, the waves are, are trapped and they all move only in the east-west direction in this theory. and all the fields in this Kelvin wave are symmetric. In other words, they peak at the equator and they have the same value at the same latitude on opposite sides of the equator. Then uh, several of these normal modes are anti-symmetric waves in terms of the divergence. When we're talking about symmetric versus anti-symmetric, we're talking about the divergence field. So this is the mixed Rossby gravity wave, or the Yanai wave. And the reason it's called the Yanai wave is because this was the first wave that was actually observed in the atmosphere shortly after Matsuno came up with his theory, who, by the way, shared an office <laughs> with Yanai. And they didn't realize initially that what Yanai was observing in the stratosphere uh, in radiosonde data were Yanai waves until they kind of Sorry. put their heads together and said, oh, it took about a year apparently. Very interesting story. But anyway, um, so in this wave you have convergence to the north of the equator and divergence to the south of the equator. Oh, I'm sorry, the other way around. Oh yeah, no, that's right. Convergence here, divergence here. So, um, and then opposite 
a half a wavelength away. So it's anti-symmetric uh, pattern of divergence. And, and this wave consists of eddies on the equator. And so you have these gyres, these circulations that are centered on the equator, giving rise to this convergence, divergence pattern. And these waves move westward. The Kelvin wave moves eastward. Okay, so we're going to look at um, th these waves in some data. And um, we're interested in the impact of these waves on convection in the tropics. So we're going to make use of a variety of um, satellite data, irradiance data, like in the animation. Um, so we have several um, um, data sources available here. And uh, this one is pre precipitation. That's the proxy for precipitation. And you can actually detect these waves very nicely in precipitation as well as brightness temperature. And then in some of the um, analyses of the circulation associated with these waves, I'm going to use reanalysis data. And we've also used radiosan data to verify what, what we get from reanalysis. These are, of course, just the best guess um, uh, estimates of what's going on in the atmosphere based on uh, data assimilation. And the ERA is, is pretty good in the tropics, so we use that a lot. Okay, I'm going to show you next some uh, wave number frequency spectral analyses. I'm not going to go into the details of how we determine these, but um, there are several steps involved. And an important one is that we first decompose the brightness temperature fields into symmetric and anti-symmetric components about the equator. Because that's what we expect from, from the theory. And we do complex Fourier transforms, FFTs, uh, first in space and then uh, in time. We average power. In this cases I'm going to show you, uh, averages are between 15 north and 15 south, so they're equatorial spectra. And then uh, we determine a background spectrum. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we divide the raw spectra by the background to get the peaks. But we don't even need to take that last step. Uh, this is a raw spectrum of brightness temperature from 1983 to 2006 for the symmetric component of brightness temperature about the equator between 15 south and 15 north. So this uses all the data, eight times daily data for this entire period. A lot of numbers go into this picture. Um, so what we have here is actually the way we plot it, we, we try to make it similar to the dispersion relationships from Matsuno's theory. We plot wave number zero in the middle or the zonal mean here and then eastward wave numbers on the right, westward wave numbers on the left and then it's linear in frequency, and these are some periods at various locations associated with those frequencies. So this diagram goes from 96 day periods up to one and a quarter day periods. And the shading is the power or the variance at each wave number and frequency. So there are several interesting features about this diagram. One is, first of all, it's very red spectrum in both time and space, which is, <coughs> excuse me, very typical of geophysical uh, um, uh, parameters. So, in other words, the power increases very rapidly towards the largest scales and the lowest frequencies. That's a red spectrum. But it's not uniform. You see a big bullseye, a big peak down here, and that actually corresponds to the Madden-Julian oscillation. That's the biggest peak by far. You can see there's much more power on the eastward side than the westward side here. So there's the MJO. And actually this peak here corresponds to Kelvin waves. And this peak, equatorial Rossby waves. And there's actually another peak up here for westward inertial gravity waves. But it's, it's uh, a lot of what is 
showing up in this diagram is also just due to the random background fluctuations. So we'd like to take the, that background out to bring out the spectral peaks. Just like when you do a frequency spectrum, you try to estimate a red noise background to measure the raw spectrum against so you know what statistically significant peaks. Uh, that's relatively easy to do uh, from, from theory based on the temporal autocorrelation of the time series that you have. But in space and time together, uh, it's, there's no analytical way to do this that, that we know of at least. Um, maybe people here could, could think about that and come up with, with, with a way. We'd, we'd, we'd love to see that. But what we did was, we did a very um, ad hoc, it's called, uh, way just, you know, what, what can we do here? Well, we'll just, we'll just smooth this spectrum many, many times using a running average in both time and space for the symmetric in the anti-symmetric anti spectrum and estimate a red noise background, which is what you see here, uh, which is supposed to still represent the autocorrelation characteristics or the redness of the data without the organization. So it's just a very rough estimate of what the background might be. You can see it's not perfect. It still has more power on the east side than the west side. Ideally, you'd want something symmetric here and so on, but it, it, it works well enough when we take this spectrum, divide by this spectrum, and end up with the spectral peaks as, as shown here. So uh, these are the peaks that stand up, ab stand above the background that we're interested in. Once again, the MJO is down here. Again, here's westward, eastward, and the periods that we're covering. And now we can identify the Kelvin wave, for instance, uh, by this relatively linear spectral peak that you see here. Uh, the equatorial Rossby wave, which corresponds to the dispersion curve from Matsuno's theory here, and westward inertia gravity wave, and so on. A, a very important point the Madden-Julian oscillation does not correspond to any of the Matsuno modes. It's, it's its own thing. And by the way, easterly waves also are not solutions of Matsuno's theory either. And uh, this is the anti-symmetric spectrum uh, with the background taken out. Again, two days here, six days here. This peak corresponds, oops, to mixed Rossby gravity waves. Put that back on. These are the so-called eastward inertial gravity waves, n equals zero eastward inertial gravity waves, and then there's an n equal two westward inertial gravity wave. There are actually an infinite number of modes corresponding to Matsuno's theory, but these gravest modes, the the lower n numbers, which have to do with the meridional structure are the ones that, that show up because they're the, the simplest ones. And uh, I mentioned that the spectral peaks actually correspond to the, the dispersion curves from Matsuno's theory. And in this case, they all seem to scale to a 25 meter equivalent depth. It's only 25 meters. I mean, the atmosphere is much deeper, obviously. And uh, I just, I'm not going to get into this, but I will point out that how these waves scale uh, to, to these actual um, observed equivalent depths is still not completely understood. Very important problem, I think. Um, Sorry? It's not related with the... Oh, okay. So it, it turns out there, there is a theory uh, Fulton and, and Schubert came up with. Uh, if you take the primitive equations, you can actually uh, back out what the equivalent depth for the drive e prim primitive equations should be. And uh, that theory actually works very well for these waves in the stratosphere. 
for dry waves. Uh, so just take the observed stratification and you get what you expect from, from that, that theory. But uh, those equivalent depths are something like uh, 100 to 300 meters. Uh, much, much larger than, than these. Why these waves scale to this equivalent depth definitely has something to do with the fact that they're convectively coupled. And it seems to be related, certainly it's related in part to the fact that um, the, um, um, the, the stability, the um, vertical stability is changed when you have convection going on. Uh, so, uh, but it, it doesn't, it, it's not an easy thing because the, the mesoscale convection uh, that makes up these waves is occurring in localized areas, but it projects somehow onto the larger scale. It's a very interesting problem, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, George? Yes. Yeah. So, in your last slide, where where are the uh, those uh, the lines you're pointing to? Are those uh, Matsuno solutions or? Yeah. Not? Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Anyway. This is uh, no. this is the yeah. It's a little confusing. Um, look at these curved lines here. These are all. Um, the mixed Rossby eastward inertia gravity wave uh, s dispersion curves for various equivalent depths. Okay, but but, but where were they on the on the main diagram? You know, on the the diagram before. Oh, I see. This is just another version of the. Mi if you go back a step. Right. To, to so the main, to the main. The, the raw one, you mean? Yeah, the raw one. Uh, I don't have the anti-symmetric raw one, but um, ah, okay. I have. I, I, I can show you in a moment. Um, well, this I is the I, raw symmetric. I meant the, I meant the theoretical Matsuno diagram. Yeah, right. Where is it? Uh, you, don't, you don't have that one. Okay, so look at this. Uh, this is symmetric um, brightness temperature yeah. spectrum. Yeah. And uh, you see a peak here mm -hmm. and peak here and mm -hmm. definitely a peak here. Right. Okay, let's go. Yeah, that one. Here. Okay, so the, the Kelvin wave's the easiest one, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I didn't label the equivalent depths here, but this is 25 meters here. Okay, so that okay, so the next to that curve is that curve there. Yeah. Okay. The the, the, the you know, yeah. I got it. It's a little confusing. But sorry. It's but it's curved on the other figure, and it's straight lines. It appears to be straight lines. Yeah, this is straight. That we don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. um, but this is kind of curved. <laughs> Okay. You know, um, yeah, it's not perfect, but the fact that there's any Close correspondence enough. at all, yeah. I think, is amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Just one quick question. Um, uh, on uh, MGO, the, uh, there is no group in right? Uh, right. <laughs> and, uh, I was just wondering if uh, that has something to do with the fact that the, that they are also MGO also travels around without being too much uh, dumped, right? Um, yeah. I mean, is, is there any comment on that? I mean, Kelvin, Kelvin is non uh, doesn't. Right. Do Most that. of the power in the MJO is in waves one and two, and it peaks in wave one. Mm -hmm. um, but you see that the um, d omega uh, uh, d dk is actually zero here too, uh, although it's horizontal. It's it's a special thing. <laughs> we should yeah we should we can talk about that afterwards. It's very that's a very interesting thing. And again, uh, this does not correspond to any of Matsuno's dispersion curves. And George, you're talking about um, how why they're not curved or straight versus the actual theoretical lines. You had mentioned that that was on a. Um, of zero background state zonal wind or something. Right, so right. has anyone ever tried to attempt to figure out how to back out the the mean advective wind? And see we did that in the GRL paper last year. Okay, I uh, did it change at all? You can, you can detect, it, it's interesting, you can detect do Doppler shifting of these waves given uh, varying 
basic state flows, but it's actually pretty hard. The, the stationary um, assumption background uh, works really well, it turns out. And um, I mean, we think that, in fact, uh, this thing is shifted a little bit this way because of easterlies, but it turns out vertical shear is very important, and Matsuno's theory doesn't account for that at all. Uh, there, other theory, much more complicated theory, has to be invoked, and some of it's consistent, some of it isn't. So that's that's another really interesting area, but it probably accounts for for some of of, of this um, um, deviation from from the linear theory. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do now is is just show you some observations of the structures of these waves, and I'm going to try to convince you that actually uh, the structure, the spatial structure and the vertical structure, well, at least the horizontal structure is, is consistent with Matsuno's theory as well. And the way we do this... I have one more question. Yeah. So why are there, why are there no observations of... Eastward propagating the gravity wave. Right. Um, we think it's because of vertical shear. Just, yeah, we, we should talk. <laughs> uh, we, uh, Stefan Tulik and I wrote a paper on that. Uh, in fact, we came by your office uh, a, a couple of years ago to talk to you about that. And I think it's, it's really still a mystery. <laughs> uh, by the way, um, uh, squall lines, uh, westward propagating squall lines uh, in, in many instances, and I think the ones over the Amazon, in fact, correspond uh, in some cases to these westward inertia gravity modes. So that's at least one framework uh, that can be used to understand them. Okay, well, say we, we were interested, like we did in that, that study, uh, in, in, in isolating the westward inertia gravity wave um, or the Kelvin wave. What you can do is filter for these waves in brightness temperature or in zonal wind or whatever field you want. So we're going to do this with, with brightness temperature. So what we do is we just kind of arbitrarily draw a box around this Kelvin peak. I mean, we have a basis for doing that, right? There's a spectral peak here. And so we want to filter this, in this case, Klaus brightness temperature for Kelvin waves. So we, we have the Fourier coefficients associated uh, when we did the calculation of, 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 of the spectrum. Uh, we got the Fourier coefficients associated uh, with each space-time bin here. We can zero out, just make set to zero the coefficients outside of a particular space-time region and retain those in an arbitrary box like this and say this is Kelvin filtered brightness temperature. So then we get a time series of Kelvin filtered brightness temperature at each grid point on the globe. So we do this separately for each grid point. Okay, and um, what I'm going to do is show you uh, a statistical structure of a Kelvin wave, in this case over the Pacific. We're going from 120 east. Here's Australia, New, New Guinea. South American coast is showing up here. Oh, there's Mexico right there. So um, we took the Kelvin filtered brightness temperature, or OLR in this case, at a point here where we know we have a lot of variability in Kelvin, Kelvin waves based on the brightness temperature uh, that we have filtered. So we pick a point, in this case 10 north, 150 west, right here. And we're using a very long data record from June through August. So this is northern summer. And we have a time series of Kelvin filtered brightness temperature at, at this point here. So picture, you know, it goes positive, negative, positive, negative. They're anomalies. And then we take reanalysis data and we just do a linear regression between, say, the zonal wind um, at any given point. So we do this separately for each grid point. 
um, on the globe, the entire globe. We even go to the North Pole. <laughs> and um, we come up with a linear relationship just based on simple linear regression between the Kelvin filtered OLR at this point and the zonal wind at this point and then the meridional wind at this point and then uh, in this case the thousand hectopascal geopotential at each point. And then we plot that for an arbitrary deviation in Kelvin, Kelvin filtered OLR in this case. It's minus 20 watt per meter squared at this point as a basis. And then we do the same thing for OLR versus itself. So by design, you have a minimum in OLR here because that's the basis. So that's in blue and that represents convection. A negative perturbation represents cold cloud tops and that's a proxy for deep convection in the tropics. And then red is suppressed or elevated anomalously high OLR on either side. Now, uh, the contours are geopotential, so positive in solid, negative in dashed, and what you see is that in this case we have high pressure to the west and low pressure to the east actually centered on the equator. We're not doing this regression for OLR on the equator because this is the dry zone. There's much less Kelvin activity due to the cold sea surface temperature along the equator here, especially in the East Pacific. So we, we choose a point in the ITCZ for this. But the dynamical fields, the pressure and the wind, you can see actually peak on the equator for the Kelvin wave, even though the brightness temperature peaks off the equator. And if I show you the theoretical Kelvin wave, you can see that it should have maximum divergence or convergence on the equator. And actually in the Indian Ocean, we do see that. Um, it tends to peak more on the equator where you, you, have, you don't have the cold sea surface temperature. But I'm gonna argue that uh, this picture looks pretty good given that this is the real atmosphere and we're comparing this to a simple shallow water sim system in theory. Um, we have high pressure to the west of the convection uh, in phase with zonal wind, low pressure to the east, so we have east release here and then convection in between. And really, that's, that's what we see here. Um, it's not perfect, there's a lot of noise, but um, it, we, we, we are pretty, well, we're 100% convinced that these really are Kelvin waves in, in the atmosphere. George, could I just ask, since the coupling to convection modifies the phase speed of the, mm -hmm. the wave, Mm -hmm. Does the fact that you have an asymmetry here in the mm -hmm. sort of convective response, how does that modify the, the wave? Well, sure, it, it certainly will. Uh, and what you just mentioned, I, I don't have the, the Hobmuller, uh, I have one on my laptop, but if you look at um, how these waves behave over the Indian Ocean, they actually do move more slowly, and then as they propagate into the Pacific, they move more quickly. So they're more like 12 meters per second out where there's more strongly coupled to convection, and then they move much more quickly. But I guess I was thinking, like in this place where right. there's an asymmetry, uh, that's know, certainly going to have an impact. Would that would that end up sort of destroying the the wave or convection? How it phases. So yeah, uh, in other words, the, the the heating is not projecting exactly right. onto the theoretical structure, so that is going to tend to interfere. Okay. Certainly, certainly that will go on. And that's why these waves don't last for, forever. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, there's dissipation due to that and all sorts of other. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the main point here is that uh, uh, these waves exist in the atmosphere. Here's the example for the westward inertia gravity wave. So in this case, 
it's a symmetric wave with respect to divergence. So we have, um, okay, now I'm plotting something that you would expect at upper levels. So we have divergence here. And if this were an upper level field, that's where you'd expect active convection and suppressed convection on either side with high pressure to the west, low pressure to the east, uh, and then this circulation, this rather complicated, more complicated circulation um, about the equator. This comes out of the data. So we filtered for westward inertia gravity wave brightness temperature at this point here, and then we projected the circulation and pressure geopotential uh, from reanalysis onto that filtered brightness temperature. By the way, I mean, there, this circulation uh, is, uh, this, this answer, this result is really not, uh, in terms of the circulation, not built in at all from the uh, assumption that this is westward inertia gravity wave brightness temperature. In other words, there's no information uh, about um, what the circulation should be the way we do this procedure. We're just giving it westward inertia gravity wave brightness temperature, but lo and behold, the westward inertia gravity wave circulation is the thing that comes out. Same thing with the mixed Rossby gravity wave. We just filter for MRG, mixed Rossby gravity wave brightness temperature, in this region in that box there. Project the data onto that at this point, and all of a sudden what pops out is an anti-symmetric structure. That's the other thing, by the way, we're not decomposing the brightness temperature into symmetric or anti-symmetric either. But that's what pops out of this analysis, an anti-symmetric structure with eddies that are centered on the equator, just exactly like you'd expect from theory. Well, not exactly. If you look here, there are some differences. And again, uh, we're, we suspect shear to account for the fact that, in theory, this should be um, pretty much uh, zonally oriented, these, these, these fields. Whereas in reality, you actually have a, a, a fairly substantial tilt in, in latitude here. We think we understand why in principle that this happens. It's due to not just vertical shear, but also horizontal shear in this case of the background basic state. So the, these waves exist, and um, you know, they, I think uh, we can argue fairly convincingly that they do account for a lot of what you see in those Hobmuller diagrams. Uh, the other thing we can do, if we start here, this is the simultaneous relationship between Kelvin filtered brightness temperature here and the circulation and pressure. We can look at the lag relationship and watch how these waves evolve as they propagate through a varying basic state from west to east. So in other words, the background zonal wind and meridional wind and, and vertical shear and so on is, is much different back here than it is out here. And uh, now we have tools to analyze how the structure of these waves change as they propagate through that varying medium. Okay, um, the last thing I'll talk about, if I have time, I think uh, I can, well, I'll go quickly. Um, I just want to mention uh, the vertical structure. And this is, of course, where Matsuno's theory falls apart. Uh, Matsuno's theory is based on just basically one layer, right, um, shallow water. And um, in the real atmosphere, you have all sorts of uh, structure in, in the background basic state in, in the vertical. So using the same approach, uh, now um, we're looking at radius on data. So data from just one point 
as waves come by. So in this case, we're using Kelvin filtered OLR at the nearest grid point to this radius on station. Many years of data go into this picture here. And we're plotting time versus pressure here of the zonal wind. Red means westerly anomalies, blue means easterly anomalies. And this is the, the actual OLR over time uh, with respect to Kelvin filtered OLR at the nearest grid point. So time's going right to left because this is an eastward moving wave and we want a cross section that kind of looks like in space what it might look like looking from, from the south. Uh, so before the wave comes through we have easterly anomalies at low levels here and then after the wave we have westerly anomalies and you can see the zonal convergence here which is actually where the OLR is a minimum and if you look at precipitation data sure enough that's where the precipitation peaks but the very interesting feature of, of the vertical structure here is this westward tilt it's not in other words it's not just a simple first baroclinic mode structure like you might expect um, in, in a lot of the tropics where you have low level convergence upper level divergence just a simple uh, opposite sign circulation and from low levels to upper levels. There's a lot of tilt here. What's the uh, time to space conversion roughly? Uh, yeah, so uh, this, this is, uh, I would say, something like four to 5,000 kilometers from, from here to here. These ways are about 10,000 kilometers wide. It's a very big tilt. Yeah, it's a re really big tilt. And um, similarly, in specific humidity, so these are specific humidity perturbations plotted in exactly the same way. So the wave's moving in, it's like the wave is moving in this direction with time going in that direction, right? So ahead of the wave, it's moist at low levels. And in fact, the moisture peaks a little bit above the, the boundary here, at the, near the top maybe the top of the boundary, well, mid-boundary mid layer. So it's moist ahead at low levels and then the convection lofts that moisture vertically as the wave goes by. And that's followed by a dry signal at low levels while it's still moist above. So the implication is that you might have, say, shallow heating, shallow convection here that leads to deep convection that leads to stratiform where you have moist over dry over time. That was for the Kelvin wave. This is the same thing for the MJO. Now we're talking about 70 days here. This is a much larger wave. It's, uh, so this would be, you know, half, this would represent something like halfway around the globe here. It's planetary scale. But we see a similar picture here where we have easterlies ahead of where the convection peaks here and westerlies following and a westward tilt with height for this eastward moving wave. I didn't put it in here, but the westward moving waves tilt in the opposite direction. So and that's very consistent if I showed you the same pictures for the mixed rossby gravity wave, the westward inertia gravity wave, they all look very similar um, just broadly and um, not necessarily in detail but in, 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 in the, the largest scale features they're very very similar. Uh, likewise this is specific humidity uh, for the MJO, we see it tends to moisten first at this 950 or so hectopascal level and then the moisture rapidly gets lofted uh, by convection um, and followed by moist over dry signal. So the amazing thing is that <laughs> if you go back to some classic studies of mesoscale convection, you see a very similar structure. This is for a squall line during gate. 
uh, from a paper from 1981 that, that Ed Zipser et al. Uh, studied. And uh, so this, this disturbance is moving from left to right. And it starts out with uh, shallow convection ahead of it, deep convection followed by stratiform. It turns out uh, when Kathy Straub and I analyzed uh, Kelvin waves uh, from field data, we saw the same thing. In a Kelvin wave moving from left to right, you have shallow, deep stratiform and warm and um, warm at low levels, uh, warm at mid levels later on, followed by warm over cold, which is a typical stratiform type of signal. Uh, I won't go through all of this, but I'll just show you our cartoon. Rich lights cartoons, so <laughs> I can't, can't resist. Um, this is just the generalized uh, uh, convectively coupled wave, which is valid all the way from the mesoscale on up to the MJO scales. In other words, there's, there's a remarkable level of self-similarity um, where these waves are all characterized basically by um, shallow convection leading to congestus, deep convection, and then followed by stratiform. Um, so what the waves do is they tend probably, we think, uh, to modulate um, the types of mesoscale convective systems within them. Okay, I'll just put my conclusions up here. Uh, I didn't talk about the temperature, but uh, you tend to have warmth ahead, cooling behind. Uh, I think uh, it's fairly convincing that a large portion of the large-scale uh, convective organization in the tropics can be explained at least broadly uh, in terms of Matsuno shallow water theory. Um, all the waves tend to have uh, this low level moisture ahead of them, uh, high cape, uh, which is la lofted rapidly as deep convection develops, followed by a stratiform signal of drying at low levels while it's still moist aloft. And uh, you can actually see that in the cloud morphology. I didn't talk about that, but um, it, it, from field data, it's quite evident now that. Um, the, the, these types of clouds follow uh, closely just what you'd expect um, from uh, these other characteristics of the waves. Thanks very much.